Let us pray. Father, in a season where every heart should be happy and light, many of us are struggling with the heaviness of life, burdens that steal our joy. Tragedy arrives as innocent victims suffer and an inner voice whispers, be afraid. We need Jesus, who is your peace. We confess that our hearts are too often filled with the worries of everyday life. In a world where worry, not peace, prevails, stir up that good news again. This Advent, make it real in our hearts. Never have we needed your joy and peace more than now. Thank you for the gift of Jesus, our Emmanuel, the Word made flesh. We not only need your peace and joy, Lord, we crave it. You have promised rest for the weary, victory for the battle-scarred, peace for the anxious, and acceptance for the brokenhearted. Not just at Advent, but every day of the year. Your name is still called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We know that peace on earth can only come when hearts find peace with you. You are still our joy. You are still our peace. You're no longer a babe in the manger. You're Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and we celebrate you as Lord this Christmas and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. From the Gospel of Luke, here is the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and we will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. And thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Last week, we read of the angel Gabriel. The Lord God dispatched him to Jerusalem, to the temple, to the holy place, at the time of the evening sacrifice. Gabriel stood by the altar of incense and found Zechariah, a country priest, at the high point of his career, offering a sacrifice of incense for his first and last time. This particular service was such a high honor that nobody was allowed to give it twice. Gabriel told the quaking Zechariah not to be afraid and then gave him wonderful news about the birth of a son. With that, 400 years of silence was broken. The Lord had given a word to his people once more. And what a blessed word it was for both Zechariah and Elizabeth and the nation as a whole. He and his wife had been unable to have children, but this sad situation would come to an end. They would have a son, and he would be a joy and delight to them. Elizabeth's reproach would be taken away. But much more important than these considerations, this son would be great in the eyes of the Lord. He would be a prophet in the spirit and power of Elijah and would turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of the disobedient to their God. He would prepare the people of Israel for the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah didn't believe the angel. He asked Gabriel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. And my wife is well along in years. Gabriel struck him dumb, and dumb he would remain until the birth of his son, nine months later, his son, John the Baptist. 
As we come to our lesson today, we find that six months has passed. God dispatches the angel Gabriel again, but this time not to Jerusalem, but to Nazareth in Galilee. His message this time is not for a priest of Israel, but for a young girl, an unlettered teenager. And this time it is not about a natural birth delayed beyond normal years, but a virgin birth unique in all human experience. When God dispatched Gabriel to Nazareth, Nazareth with this amazing message for Mary, the angel did not say to God, I beg your pardon, I've just been to a priest at the temple in the middle of a worship service, I gave him good news, he flat out didn't believe me. And now you want me to go to a peasant girl with an even more incredible announcement. Are you sure about this? There was none of that. Gabriel went immediately, without question and without demurring. That's what angels do. They always obey. The good angels, they always obey. He obeyed, you know where the bad angels are. <laughs> he obeyed promptly and cheerfully, as he'd always done from the time of his creation. Every week when we are together, we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we pray that, let's remember the example of Gabriel. Let it be an encouragement and a spur to us to a quicker, more urgent, and more cheerful obedience to the Lord. So today we're going to look at four things. Where Gabriel went, the young woman to whom he spoke, what he said to her, and how she responded. So let's look at the lesson. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. As he came to earth that day, Gabriel ignored Judea, which had been the center of God's work down through the centuries. He went instead to Galilee. Galilee was a land held in contempt by many Jews because its population down through the years had in great measure intermarried with Gentiles though intermarriage was strictly forbidden in the law. As a result, they'd become to a large extent a mixed people. The people of Galilee were commonly and cruelly dismissed as mongrels. Bypassing Jerusalem, the seat of David's kingdom and the Lord's temple, Gabriel went to Galilee and specifically to Nazareth. Nazareth was an obscure little nothing of a place. I've been there. It's still you know, nothing really great to talk about. It's... It's a little bigger now. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned in the works of Josephus or in any rabbinical writings of the time. It was a shoddy, corrupt halfway stop between the cities of Tyre and Sidon. It was infested with Gentiles and Roman soldiers. Nathaniel, a disciple Jesus described as being without guile, a forthright plain speaker, once asked if anything good could come from Nazareth. The place did not seem like much, but then neither did the girl to whom Gabriel appeared. She had nothing in the way of recognizable credentials. She was a teenager, possibly 14 or 15. She was too young to have known anything of the world or to have accomplished anything much. She was most likely illiterate, but at the same time, it's clear she had a good grounding in the faith. We'll see when we come to her song, The Magnificat. That's on Christmas Eve in the morning. Her knowledge of the Bible was clearly extensive. It came from attending worship at the synagogue and memorizing large portions of scriptures. In normal circumstances, she would marry, have a big, poor family, and never travel more than a few miles from her home, living and dying quietly and in obscurity. And so it was that the greatest news ever proclaimed in Israel came to the humblest of people. Mary sings about that in our lesson in a few weeks. My soul doth, doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit doth rejoice in God my Savior, for he hath been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. Nine months later, the angels would proclaim the birth of the Messiah to humble shepherds in the fields. The good news comes to the poor and humble, the meek and lowly. Martin Luther put it this way, Gabriel might have gone to Jerusalem and picked out Caiaphas' daughter, who was fair, rich, clad in golden embroidered raiment and attended by a retinue of maids in waiting. But God preferred a lowly maid from a mean town. Why does he come to the lowly? For two reasons. First of all, he comes to the humble because they have room for him. Kent Hughes put it this way. The Lord comes to needy people 
those who realize that without him they cannot make it, those who acknowledge their weakness and spiritual lack, the incarnation, salvation, resurrection, and Christmas are not for the proud and self-sufficient. And second, he comes to the humble, lowly, and weak, so that the glory might shine all the more brightly as he works through their weakness. When the Apostle Paul was given a thorn in his flesh, he prayed for God to remove it. God didn't. Instead, he sent Paul this word, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul gloried in the news, saying, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. When Paul was weak, it became utterly clear that God was strong. Now when Gabriel approached Mary, this is what happened. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. So Gabriel tells Mary two things. First, she's highly favored. And second, the Lord's presence is with her. That Mary is highly favored, or full of grace, as it's sometimes translated, has caused a serious mistake about her to be made. The Roman Catholic Church holds that Mary is so full of grace that rather than simply being a recipient of grace, she's also a dispenser of grace. They believe that Mary has grace abundant and overflowing, and so if a person goes to her in prayer, saving grace can be received from her. In some Roman circles, Mary has been elevated to the status of a co-redeemer, a co-mediator, the co-redemptrix, they call her sometimes. Some have gone so far as to say that no one comes to the Father but by Mary, but Scripture is absolutely clear on this point. There's one mediator and one mediator only between God and man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Mary, like everyone else born except the Lord Jesus, was born a sinner born under a curse, born with a dead and stony heart, born in desperate need of a Savior. It's not just Protestants that believe that. The Orthodox believe that. Most Christians believe that. That song I sang last week, to me the most theologically correct part about it is, did you know the child that you delivered would soon deliver you? Mary needed to be delivered too. Now, unfortunately, because the Roman Catholics have accorded Mary a divine or semi-divine status, Protestants tend to ignore Mary, and that's too bad because Mary is a model for those who experience the birth of the Savior in their hearts. We've seen that Mary had a humble heart. We'll also find out that the mother of our Lord had a reflective heart, a believing heart, and a submitted heart. These are qualities we too must cherish and nurture in our lives if we're to mature in the faith and grow as disciples. Reflective, believing, and submitted. So, to her humility, Mary added a reflective disposition as well. When the angel made his presence known and greeted Mary, the Bible says she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this must be. The word wondered here means that she kept pondering the import of Gabriel's words. What do these words mean for me? What will they require from me? Mary had a reflective nature. There's a lovely passage about that in Luke chapter 2. Jesus has been born. The angels have given the shepherds the news. They have run to the manger. And here's the text. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about his child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She pondered the things of God in her heart, coming back to them time and time again. Here's an interesting story. The poet Robert Southey was an English romantic poet, a contemporary of Woodsworth and Coleridge, and he was a remarkable man. As well as being a poet, he was an essayist, a historian, and a biographer. He wrote biographies of John Bunyan, John Wesley, William Cowper, Oliver Cromwell, and Horatio Nelson. He wrote a history of Brazil and the Peninsular War. And one day, he told an old Quaker lady how he filled his day. He studied Portuguese grammar while he washed and shaved something else while he had breakfast and something else again in the morning. 
He gave detail after detail of a life filled with activity of one sort or another. She said to him quietly, and when does thee think? Don't get so busy that you cannot take time each day to ponder the things of God. Like Mary, take time to reflect upon the Lord and the things of the Lord. Do this especially when you're having trouble with the disciplines of prayer. When you're finding prayer difficult, try this. Stop trying to pray and instead think about God. Ponder his attributes, his immensity, power, infiniteness, his holiness, his righteousness, his wisdom, his goodness, his mercy, compassion, and love. Ponder not only who he is, but also what he has done, his creation, his providence, his redemption in Christ, his promising to come again. And as you reflect upon God, focusing upon who he is and what he has done, prayer will come. You will find yourself praising and glorifying him. His beauty is such that you won't be able to help it. Seek him first, and the rest will follow. So let's continue with the lesson at verse 30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus, the name means Savior, will be great. We learn here that he will be a priest greater than Abraham, a prophet greater than Moses, and a king greater than David. He will be called Son of the Most High. That is to say, he will have a divine nature. He's of the same substance as the Father and the Holy Ghost co-equal, and co-eternal. In Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Paul puts it this way in Philippians, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. John puts it this way in Revelation, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Now, when Mary got this astounding news that among all the women who ever lived or ever would live, she was the one who would bear the Christ child, she asked a question. How will this be, since I'm a virgin? So let's note this. Mary believes the angel. Her question is not an indication of doubt. Here, she differs from Zechariah, who, when given astounding news, disbelieved and asked for a sign. Mary does not doubt. She does not ask for a sign. But she's mystified because she knows how babies are born and she knows she doesn't fit the bill. It's a biological question she asks. You see, as well as having a humble and reflective heart, Mary has a trusting, believing heart. And the angel provided the answer. It would be through the power of the Holy Spirit that the pregnancy would occur. Even as the Spirit was present and hovering over the waters at the time of creation, so the Spirit would be present at the birth of Christ. In fact, the Spirit would be present with Jesus all along the path of redemption. This is what J.C. Ryle says. In every step of the great work of man's redemption, we shall find special mention of the work of the Holy Ghost. Did Jesus die to make atonement for our sins? It is written that through the eternal spirit he offered himself without spot to God. Did he rise again for our justification? It is written that he was quickened by the spirit. Does he supply his disciples with comfort between the time of his first and second advent? It is written that the comforter whom he promised to send is the spirit of truth. Let us take heed that we give the Holy Ghost the same place in our personal religion which we find him occupying in God's word. Let us remember that all believers have and are and enjoy under the gospel. They owe to the inward teaching of the Holy Spirit 
The work of each of the three persons of the Trinity is equally and entirely needful to the salvation of every saved soul. The election of God the Father, the blood of God the Son, and the sanctification of God the Spirit ought never to be separated in our Christianity. The Holy Spirit would bring about the birth of Christ. How? Well, suffice it to say that with God nothing is impossible. Nothing is too difficult for him who is omnipotent. He would speak a word and it would be done. As Christ's birth was a miracle, so it was a miracle when we were born again. We looked at our sin and wondered if there was any way that we could be pardoned. We found that there is no sin too black to be pardoned because the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. We looked at our hearts and wondered if they could be changed. And we found that even a heart of stone can be made into a heart of flesh through the power of Christ's Spirit. We looked at our calling to walk godly in Christ and wondered if we might take even a small step on that journey. And we found that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We felt burdens and wondered if they were too heavy to carry and experienced trials and thought they might be too severe to endure, but we found that the grace of God is sufficient. There's no promise God has made that's too great to be fulfilled because his word will never pass away. And what he has promised, he will accomplish. There's no difficulty too great to surmount because if God is for us, who can be against us? Even the mountains will be made low and the valleys lifted up and the rough places made smooth. If sinners like you and me can be cleansed and made fit to enter the presence of God, a virgin can give birth if God has so ordained. So here's one last point. In response to the angel's answer, Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Mary had a submitted heart. Now, in those days, let's remember, it was no small thing for a woman to become pregnant out of wedlock. She was facing ridicule, criticism, divorce, and possible stoning. There was a huge cost to be borne. Nevertheless, Mary placed herself, body and soul, at God's disposal. C.S. Lewis once said, there are only two kinds of people in the world. There are those who say, my will be done, and those who say, thy will be done. And Mary was one of the latter. And as such, she provides us a model and example of godly Christian living. She was humble and poor of spirit, and so open to the grace of God. She was reflective and so open to the word and work of God in her life. She was believing and so welcoming of the Holy Spirit. She was submitted and so was now and always will be called blessed by all generations. Humble, reflective, believing, submissive. Here's the question for us today. Have we said in our hearts, I am the Lord's servant, may it be to me as you have said? God grant us grace that we might be able to say, yes, Lord, let your will be done in me now and always. May we make that profession with our lips and in our hearts, in Christ's name, amen.